Hi everybody, and welcome to my ninth beam video. In this video I'm going to be solving the problem you see here, and I'm going to be finding the location and magnitude of the maximum bending stress. If you want to know something else about beams or about mechanics and materials, feel free to check out my dozens of other videos. So if we want to find the max bending stress, we should know what that depends on. And we're going to use our formula that we've seen before, my over i where M is the bending moment, Y is the distance from the neutral axis, and I is the moment of inertia. So all we need to do now is maximize this. So we're going to find sigma max when we have M max, Y max, and moment of inertia is constant. So let's go about and find M max and Y max. So we'll do M max first, the bending moment. All right, so we need to find the bending moment. And the best way to do this, of course, is to make the whole system of cuts, draw a bending moment diagram, and pick out the biggest value in terms of magnitude. So let's start with that. In order to do the bending moment diagrams, we need an overall reaction. So let's do that first with an overall free body diagram. Alright, and if we just go through and simply sum up the forces in the Y. Alright, now we have L and P. I'm just going to solve the whole thing in variables since it's not too complicated and then just plug in the values at the very end. Alright, now I assume the reactions were equal because of the symmetry of the whole situation. If you're not convinced, call this R1, R2, take bending moments, and you'll find that, that indeed they are the same. So I'm moving on, let's find the bending moment in these. So the bending moment is internal. We expose internal things by making cuts. We'll start just with making two cuts, and then we'll see if we can piece together the bending moment of the last piece due to the symmetry of the first piece. Alright, so let's go ahead and make a free body diagram of the first piece. Alright, so I've drawn it all out, labeled all my forces and my directions, always important so other people who are reading your work know what you mean when you say positive or negative moment. Now we can simply sum up the moments about V1. Again, it's always best to do it about the cut end, because if you do it about this end, you'll need to use V1. So you need to find V1 first. There's a slight chance you can make an error in V1. If you use V1, you'll have the error in M as well. We're taking the moment out of here over from here you eliminate that little bit of room for error. Alright, now we take a look at piece two. Get a free body diagram of that.
All right, so here we go, the free body diagram of the second piece. Now, I chose x to start at the position where the condition has changed. All right, the condition changed, of course, is the addition of P2. You can take x to be this whole thing, all right? But like I've said before, if you develop an equation with x as the whole length, the values of x that you have in your function will only be applicable over a certain range of values of x, which could get slightly confusing and the biggest reason why I do it this way is because when we go to plot our shear force diagram and our bending moment diagrams later on, it's easier when you have your x based off a coordinate system that has its origin right at the base of where you're starting. So when you need to draw a line, you don't need to figure, okay, I'm drawing this line and it needs to be over here somewhere in the system where I have x measured the whole thing. It'll be over here somewhere, All right? But now in this system, where you take x measured here, you can just you know start your graph just like you normally would. All right, so taking the moments once again about this little piece that's cut here. All right, and there you have it, the bending moment in each case. All right, we didn't bother to go for the shear force because we didn't need it to solve for sigma. Let's go ahead and plot these. All right, there we go. Now, we know that information for the bending moment in the first piece, and one that's p by 2x, so it's just a slope, a linear slope, and the slope's magnitude is just p by 2. All right, once we get here, we start at pl by 8, which turns out to be this point right where we stopped, and we'll go up a slope with px, so that's twice the slope as we had right here, which was p by 2. Alright, and now, like we said before, we can just rely on the symmetry of the problem to solve the rest. Alright, I said that up here somewhere, and just looking at this, if this half here produces a bending moment diagram that looks like this, then this half should produce the same, because it's exactly symmetric. All right, so we can just go ahead and plot that in. All right, this only works for symmetry in the initial situation. That means symmetry both in length and in loading. All right, so our maximum, because that's what we're after to find our maximum stress. If you evaluate M2 at a distance X equals L by four, this distance here, you get that the maximum bending moment at the top is all right and there's a first piece of the puzzle we need to solving our sigma all right the second one is y all right so what y distance should we use while taking a look at our cross section here it's not too hard to see All right, now a neutral axis is what we measure x from, and a neutral axis is a centroid. 
All right, so this is where y is measured from. So what's going to give our maximum value of sigma? Well, it's the greatest value of y. And in this case, y is greatest when we're at the top or the bottom. Okay, so we can say if we use this as b and this as h, we can say y is equal to plus or minus h by 2. All right, second piece of the puzzle. Third piece of puzzle is the moment of inertia. Okay, and that's the moment of inertia about the centroid of the piece. All right, that's very important that it be about the centroid. In this case, we know the location of the centroid, so we can just use the formula, moment of inertia about a centroid of a square is bh cubed by 12. All right, that's very specific to its centroid. So it was displaced a distance away, so if you had like a bar like this and another bar stacked on top, the moment of inertia about the actual centroid of the piece, which would be here, would be a different calculation, right? Because you can't just say this moment of inertia contribution of this piece is this bh cubed. You have to use the parallel axis theorem because it's offset from your centroidal axes. So that's a question for another video. So our case is just simply bh cubed by 12. All right? And if we're symbolically doing this, that's all the information we need. So going back to putting all the pieces together, we know that sigma is equal to m y by i. Now I'm going to drop the negative sign and we're just going to solve this. And then we can know that our final answer is just plus or minus y because here we have plus or minus. So let's go ahead and plug in our values. All right, and after simplifying, you can find All right, now, this is an actually numerical value. So this is the sigma max, but technically speaking, we should say the magnitude of sigma max because it occurs at two locations, depending on whether or not we choose y to be plus or minus h by 2. So let's just go back and take these values that we had over here, plug them in, and get a numerical answer. All right, there we go, that's our final answer. The greatest magnitude of the stress in this particular beam situation is 6.75 GPA, and it occurs at the center of the beam, because that's where we took a bending moment from, and at the top and bottom of the beam. All right, so that brings us to the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed, and you got something useful out of it, and I'll hope to see you in my next bunch of beam videos.